Google Now on tap, a family-friendly version of the Google Play Store, and put all your photos online for the rest of your life for free. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 347 for Thursday, May 28th, 2015. Welcome. I am Megan Maroney, and this is the show where we watch the three-hour keynote speeches so you don't have to. Let's get to today's big news. According to the Google blog today, developers at the annual Google I.O. conference in San Francisco drank over 1,500 gallons of coffee I guess they didn't expect much from this morning's keynote. Ron Richards helps Leo Laporte, Gina Trapani, and Aaron Newcomb cover this this morning on our network. And Ron has agreed to come back. Welcome back, Ron. It's good to be back. I can't stop talking about Google. <laughs> yeah, so the, those of, who don't know, who haven't been watching you all day, you're a podcaster, a pundit, co-host of All About Android on Twit, frequent contributor to the Daily Tech News Show with Tom Merritt. You do all the things. Welcome. <sighs> I try to keep busy, you know, yeah. and and Google I/O is like it's like our Christmas. It's like our one time a year where we can, where we get it. We get to, to see what's going on inside the uh, Google Plex and see what they're working on. So uh, it's a ton of fun to talk about. So right. So what was the biggest announcement in your opinion today? Well, it was it wasn't so much. I mean, the thing about it, and I was talking earlier um, earlier today about it on Twitter with some folks. It, it, this we we've kind of built up these kind of uh, keynote presentations to have high expectations, and this uh, this year's keynote at I/O didn't really have any big wow mind blowing moments, but it had a bunch of incremental things that add up to show a real uh, I think a real progress and a real evolution of what Google has been doing, both with the Android platform just as well as in general or just across the internet and across connectivity. Um, if it, and Megan, you probably you watched the keynote. You probably saw some of the coverage. Um, if you ask me, the through line or the story of the keynote was Google. You know, now has you know they had that task of indexing the world and 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 search and giving us all this information. And now it seems that they're about connecting everyone together and with all their devices around the world. Um, and there was a lot of talk about you know billions of downloads and billions of users and billions of phones and and keeping them connected. And you didn't see a huge focus on Google's main suite of products, but rather an embracing kind of you know you saw a lot of mention of iOS and a lot of mention of other apps and things like that. So. It was really kind of interesting to see kind of Google kind of opening up their their worldview with the with this uh, presentation today. Right, yeah. they they see Microsoft doing that and they say, oh, they're, they're getting a lot of good attention for that. Maybe we'll do the same. <laughs> maybe or maybe it's maybe that's just the trend now. I mean, maybe I mean Satya over at Microsoft is onto something with it, but um, but maybe you know like that that's just kind of the the harmonious Star Trek utopian direction we're going in. Hopefully, so. right? Dogs and yeah. cats, everything. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> so let's talk about Android M that was announced today. They're calling it the most powerful Android version yet. There's improved battery life, updates to do Google Now, more control over the permissions that we give apps. Those are just some of the highlights. Uh, what did you think about Android M? I, it was funny because when Jason and I and the other guests on All About Android have been guessing about what's coming up on uh, what's going to happen at Google I.O., I was the the pessimist or the naysayer saying I didn't think they were going to talk about Android M, although then it was revealed that they, they were going to and it became a fact. But um, I was surprised to see that not only were they talking about Android M, but also that, uh, you know, that it's going to roll out in Q3 of this year, which I think is really soon after Lollipop. Um, but no real, you know, Lollipop was such a big uh, update, you know, with material design and the UI effects and things like that. Android M was de was described on focusing on quality, and it looks like they're taking the things that weren't quite perfect on uh, Lollipop and refining them and making them, you know, smoothing out the edges and making it even a stronger OS. Um, and given that, you know, and given some of the stuff they talked about, whether the uh, app permissions or the battery life stuff or things like that, it looks like they're they're going in the right direction. So. Right. They also showed off a preview of Android Pay. It looks a lot like Apple Pay, thumbprint and everything. Uh, yeah. What did you think of that? I heard uh, a sigh. Yeah, well, I mean, we knew it was coming. We knew that we knew that they were going to rebrand. I mean, it's basically Google Wallet. 
Um, it's it's Google Wallet Plus almost in that in that way, and that it's a payment system, but they've baked it deeper into the apps themselves, so it's easier to purchase things within the apps. Um, it's easier to connect to stores and just use the tap to pay and things like that. Um, but this is just the arms. This is just the mobile payments arms race, and this is you know Google keeping up with Samsung and keeping up with Apple, of course, um, uh, and trying to you know cut their piece of the pie for those mobile payments. So wasn't surprised to see it. Wasn't surprised that it's called Android Pay. Uh, you know, I saw some people in the chat room earlier today wondering whether or not you can trademark the word pay and i don't think you can i think you can trademark apple pay but or android pay but um uh, everybody every you know google apple and samsung they all want to be the middleman of your mobile payments when you're using your phone to pay you know to pay with it uh and for good reason because they want to control that experience and so uh this is something google has to do right so. but there was no talk of of android pay on android wear yet no, which which would be neat. I mean, and, and actually, actually, Android Wear was the one thing that I was really disappointed by in the presentation because they didn't really announce anything new or show anything that's coming up. They just kind of touted what they've done with Android Wear in the past year and highlighted some of the recent changes that happened with the latest update to the to the operating system. But no mention of paying by tapping your watch on the uh, you know on the on the terminal or anything like that. But you got to assume that's coming. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I've been using my Apple Watch to pay, and I love it. I mean, I'm, I think I've gotten over the the embarrassment of people looking at me like, what are you doing? Who do you think you yeah. are? You know, but yep. it's so easy uh, and it's, and it works. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it probably is the future for all of us. Yeah. It's gotta, it's gotta come sooner or later, I'd imagine. So. Right. So one thing we both already mentioned, the permission in apps, that was kind of a big deal. Uh, what's the story behind that? Yeah, so back in the early days of Android, um, we actually had a lot more control over what the apps could do on the user level. You could control the permissions as to whether or not it had access to um, my, you know, my photos or my contacts or things like that. And then as Android evolved, they kind of took that away. And you just got that general overview permission dialogue when you install an application, um, which over the past couple of years has kind of become like the uh, Eddie Izzard terms of service. Like, yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. You know, like I don't really read what they're what I'm giving you permission to, you know, like, yes, you're going to take location. You're going to take my contacts. You're going to take all this stuff. That's the price to pay for this app. Um, with the update in Android M, they're bringing back some user control. Um, but not, I think the right balance. And so, for example, it's it's contextual. So if I'm using, um, if the example they showed was WhatsApp, if I'm using WhatsApp to message and I want to use the microphone to leave a voice, uh, you know, to, to voice dictate my message, the first time I interact with the microphone in that app, it will come up with a dialogue that says, do you give this app permission to use your microphone? And I say yes, and then I use it and it remembers that permission. And every time you use the app moving forward, it doesn't ask you every time you use it because you already answered yes. Um, if you want to go back and change that permission, you can in the settings of the app as well as you can look up by the function. So if I wanted to say, okay, show me all the apps that are using my microphone. Um, and I see an app in there, I'm like, oh, I don't want that to be able to hear what I'm saying. You can turn it off from that control level. So it's giving you both the app access as well as the settings access to control those permissions, which is really kind of an intuitive approach to it. Right. It really makes sense yeah. because sometimes you have no idea why they're asking that. You just say no and then you have to go right. back and, you know, or I mean, just well, how many apps we're giving our location to when we don't necessarily need to or want to. I mean, there was a story, I don't know if you saw this past week about Facebook Messenger and how people can take location from Facebook Messenger. Someone created a Chrome extension, I think, called Marauders Map. I don't know if you yep. read anything about that, but it, you can just sort of track all your friends and see exactly where they are. Um, it was a little creepy. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, and, the, and it's totally at the point, I know personally for me, I just give every app every permission because I want to use the app and I don't care, whatever. And I, I'm of the I'm of the, the, the point where I'm my information isn't that interesting. I don't think anybody really cares where I am. But there are some people who really do care about that and they don't want their location available. I know that Facebook Messenger is specifically, that is an app that I told, do not point, post my location. Like, I don't want you to know where I am. And so um, this just, you know, widens that control that the users have. And I think it's the uh, step in the right direction by making it intuitive. So. Right. So what about the battery features? Uh, what's What did they talk about there? There's always battery. They, every, every keynote, every time they do an Android update, they look at the battery. They look at how everything works. But um, this time around, they, they introduced something really neat called Doze, which I think is a smart way of approaching it, which is, you know, um, 
our, our devices are always, you know, always on. They're always talking. You know, they're always doing something. You know, in terms of talking to a server, or doing something in the cloud. Um, what they're introducing with Android M with this Doze function is to look at the uh, accelerometer or the actual the the physics of the phone and detect on when I've put my phone down for an a for hours at a time. And if they look at the graph that they showed in the keynote, they showed like a 24 hour usage pattern and you see the, the spikes of when you're using your phone and when the phone is actually being moved and that sort of thing when you're walking. But then you see when you go to bed, the phone doesn't move for six hours or seven hours. So um, the phone is being smart and realizing that, okay, the phone's not being used during this time, so let me shut things down. Let me go into a sleep mode. Let me go into a doze mode and, and not ping the server every couple of minutes. Let me do it once every hour or, or sometime. Still be able to receive calls, still be able to receive messages, but minimize the usage and the drain that the battery is taking and so that you can get more life out of your device. Interesting. So let's move on to one of the big announcements, Google Photos. I am a huge fan of Google Photos. I've, I was a Picasso fan since the very beginning. I think this is amazing. I had an Android phone for the past few years. When I switched over to the iPhone, the whole iCloud experience is really frustrating, especially for an Apple product when I usually don't find that. And now my photos are all over the place on Dropbox, Flickr, SmugMug. I use an app called Trunks. But Google <laughs> says they can host them all for free. Why are they doing that? Well, it's a it's a big move. That was a big move, and that got a big reaction in the in the, in the crowd in the keynote. Um, previously, Google, Google Photos has been a big knot that that for some reason they've tied over the past couple of years. It was uh, deeply integrated. They moved, they had the Picasa product, like you mentioned, and then they moved it to Google Now. And it was deeply integrated with Google Now. And that was neat because they're trying to build up Google Now and they're trying to build up that as a social network. And photos kind of made sense there because you've got photos on Facebook and that sort of thing. But um, they received a lot of feedback from their from users uh, that there was too much integration into Google Now. And so this move for Google Photos, um, in addition to giving you, you know, unlimited storage, which is below, like I don't understand why you would pay for Flickr or any other service after you can get a limited storage from Google where it's pretty secure. And, and, and you could depend on it. Um, but it's interesting because um, the head of Google, both Google Plus as well as Google Photos, uh, Bradley Horowitz, uh, he, in an interview today to go along with this launch, um, he kind of compared um, Google the Google Photos product that they announced today to kind of doing what, um, doing for photos what Gmail did for email. So they kind of want to, this, this Google Photos product to be like, you know, you know, Gmail for your photos, um, a way to archive and uh, a search for and access your photos. Um, the example in the keynote was really interesting where they've, um, they're able to use face, face recognition and, and item recognition. So you can categorize all your photos of uh, photos of people or photos of things or photos of places. Or the example that, um, that the guy who was presenting it gave, which I thought was really compelling which was he wanted to find photos of a snowstorm in Toronto from a few years ago. So he just searched for snow, snow in Toronto and it came up with all of his photos that were there. And that's really kind of a smart way. And it's a different way of accessing photos than we've been used to. Um, so, you know, I was kind of, this was, this was the least uh, surprise of the keynote because so much stuff had been leaked and so much stuff had come out about this and we knew it was coming. But some of the little touches that they added um, and also like the UI approaches where you could just group together a bunch of photos um, with your finger or the pinch and zoom and things like that, those we didn't know were coming. And those were nice to see that, that, that it was more than just, a, oh, it's a new, a new way to you know, store your photos. They actually added to the conversation. Right. And I think, yeah, the average person, you know, the non-techie person, this is probably going to be the thing that would be most useful to them. And yeah. they also announced that it would be on iOS also, not just on Android. <laughs> Yeah, going back to that openness thing is that is that you know this is now available for any user. It doesn't necessarily have to be just someone on the Android platform. So um, you know, Google Photos launched both on the web, Android, and iOS today. Uh, I, I updated my app and I got I got the new app and it looks pretty neat. Um, but yeah, it's it's really kind of also what I what I like about it is that it really um, drives sharing. Um, previously with Google Now, you need, you know, someone else needed to, not Google Now, I'm sorry, with Google Plus, someone else, if you wanted to share photos, they needed to go into Google Plus, they needed to log in, they needed to be able to, you know, to access your account, be friends. It was kind of, it was really obfuscated as to share, sharing photos. Now you can group together a bunch of photos and send someone just a link, which is like, I feel like that's the thing we've always wanted. 
Um, and now we've got it. And if that person happens to be a Google user, they can just save the photos to their album. And they just made it really simple and really open, which is really nice to see. Yeah, that is interesting because I'm, you mentioned Flickr before. Why would anyone pay for Flickr? I think they just made an announcement a few weeks ago that you know you can get a terabyte for free uh, videos and photos. And you know Amazon will let you upload all your photos also for free. But yep. um, the comparison to Gmail is great because you know Hotmail existed and Yahoo Mail existed before Gmail. But uh, they were not good, <laughs> and so right. this is hopefully that the, the comparison is accurate. That this will be what we need, like easily, you know, send links and you know s store things and find things and just you know just the easy experience that we found in Gmail compared to the free email that we'd had in the past. So yeah, and I think I think the key thing here is that Google is applying what they know about what works on the application side and the storage side and all the technical stuff, but they're talking to users and they're hearing about how do users want to interact with this sort of thing, and they're trying to build an application that speaks to users, but also in a way that we not, might not be expecting. Um, you know, you definitely, the Gmail comparison, you definitely remember life before Gmail. You know, email was was a certain way, and then Gmail came along and it changed the way we looked at it. You know, archiving and conversation views and things like that. So I'm excited to see what they do with this photos platform. I mean, this photos announcement was one that I was very blase about. Now I'm actually kind of, uh, the more I think about it, the more I'm excited for it. Yeah. So what about the Google Now announcement? They are having Google Now on tap. Explain what that is. Google Now on Tap is really cool. Um, so Google Now, and I'm I'm bullish on this, and and I imagine we'll we'll talk about some of the the, the potential concerns about it. But uh, Google Now on Tap basically takes the Google Now application that they've that's already existed on Android, where um, it uses your what Google knows about you to serve you up information that you might want to know. So if you you know if in your email you have a flight information and it's a flight that's delayed, you open up Google Now, it will tell you the flight is delayed before you look it up, kind of anticipating your needs. Google Now on Tap takes that one step deeper in that it interacts with the applications you use and gives you contextual guides based off what you're interacting with. So the example in the video that we're showing here now is, you know, you're listening to Skrillex on Spotify and you want to know what his real name is. You just go to Google Now on Tap and say, what's his real name? And it tells you. Um, or the other example that they gave is, you know, a friend of yours emails you and says, hey, let's go to dinner. Let's go to that restaurant we were talking about and mentions the restaurant in your email. You just tap on the home button and pull up Google Now on tap and it pulls up the restaurant location and a link to maps and a link to open table to go make a reservation. It's Google Now anticipating what that next action is based off the information that you're absorbing. Um, I think it's really powerful and could be, you know, it just makes using your phone that much easier. Right. I mean, I remember the first time, you know, it, the, my phone just suddenly showed me my flight when I didn't ask it, you know, it just yep. grabbed it out of the email. And I was like, wow, I didn't even know that. But then you start to think about what else does it know about me that I don't know that it knows. So, yeah, I think, I mean, you've already said that, you know, you don't care if anybody knows anything about you, except <laughs> apparently whether Facebook Messenger knows where you are. That's the only right, thing you're yeah. concerned about. Uh, you pick and choose, right? So, but but the, th the thing is, is that Google is a company that we have chosen to trust. I mean, you know, if you're using Gmail, you're, you're, actively storing intimate information about yourself on your server. So you've already chosen to trust them. And so I really, you know, like I understand being protective of information and not want, you know, and, and with NSA concerns and things like that. But I think that's kind of tinfoil hatty kind of crazy stuff. Um, but the more you utilize the application, the more the application works better for you and it just enhances your experience. And I think Google respects the users enough to know that that's a sacred thing that they can't breach. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, when they first started serving ads, according to our Gmail, I think I did trust them a little bit more than I might now. Um, but yeah, and I also have a 12 year old daughter who I just, you know, handed over an Android phone to. So, um, you know, that's a whole different matter of, you know, what kind of information do they know about her? You know, what kind of location information is she constantly sharing? Uh, it's good for some things. I know where she is at all times, but, you know, maybe other people do too. <laughs> so, right. yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just good. I mean, you're, you're totally true. You know, it's like we don't have to use any of these services yeah. and we're already trusting them with so much. So it's knowing what we're trusting with them is, you know, the most important thing here. Yeah, and it's the kind of thing where if this is a little too creepy of an integration, you, you, you flip the switch and turn it off. Right. You know, um, but that said, I'm I'm excited to use it. I mean, just see just seeing the the examples they showed in the demo were really impressive, and and a lot of those demos are canned and and done in advance to avoid any you know kind of blue screen of death failures on stage. But um, but those were practical uses that I find myself doing all the time, and I totally could see myself doing that. You know, you're you get a message from someone they said, oh, I just saw Tomorrowland, and I'm like, oh, I want to know more about that movie, and it just 
br brings up the link to IMDb or the link to Flickster or, or, or wherever, uh, what other, other application you might need. Um, that's really cool. So. Yeah, it does look a lot like what we saw um, at the Microsoft announcement uh, in January, you know, with Cortana, yeah. you know, that was a lot of what Joe Belfori was saying, you know, saying like, here's, you can get the restaurant and, you know, whether they have, you know, the food that you want. And so, um, but, you know, we'll see if maybe they'll all be able to do this or yeah. if Google will continue to be able to do it, this kind of stuff better as they have been. Well, what, what I and what I thought was interesting about the about the Google on Tap demo was that you know it wasn't just in Google applications like the um, the Messenger example, like the getting a text message from somebody that was in Viber, that wasn't in Hangouts, you know. And it goes back to that idea of openness and the fact that this is an application layer that's working on top of the non Google apps that you might be using. Um, you know, and of course, there's the concern as to what data are they storing and how much is passed through. And I know, I know the the data doesn't actually get triggered until you actually tap on it. Um, so there's some level of you know the 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 device is dumb until you interact with it. Uh, but still, it's neat to see it working, just working out of the box with other applicate with other native applications. So. Right. So what about the Google offline maps? Now you can put your directions in, and if you go offline, you lose access. You can still have the maps and the turn by turn directions. That's interesting. And that's that's the dream, right? That's the that's the I never want to get lost. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that that's just great. I mean we've already had the ability to have downloadable maps, but the idea that you would have to um, know in advance that okay, I'm going this place, I need to download the map and set it to offline mode. But now the idea that it's it's storing it in advance, and so if I search for directions, it's keeping it local, and so when I lose my connection, I can still access it because I don't know about you, Megan, but I, there have been times where I I you know was driving up and and hit a valley and have no server. And then boom, I don't know where, you know, I can't pull up the, I, I go to reload the map and it doesn't load. And then you're lost for a couple of minutes, you're lost and you don't want that to happen. Right. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I still remember, you know, going to your PC and printing out the map and, you know, yeah. carrying it with you. And, you know, and then we just stopped doing that and then would get stuck just like you're describing. Yeah. I've definitely yeah. been there. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Google Cardboard. Um, what were the announcements about that today? Well, yeah. So Google Cardboard was the was the surprise of last year's I/O. That was the little the last minute, you know, kind of. Oh, by the way, you we we gave you a little gift, and it turned out to be this neat little cardboard device that was a VR screen, kind of like an Oc Oculus kind of interface that you could slide your phone in and uh, interact with VR applications. Um, over the past year, cardboard. You know, I, I wonder. I would love to hear the story about the. the Cardboard's invention and their expectations, because I got to imagine that the past year um, with cardboard has exceeded their expectations. That the number of people who have embraced it, and the fact that we're seeing devices now that are coming out, you know, car that that are made for cardboard, and it's really kind of Google's, you know, kind of lo-fi entry into the VR space, where you know, Oculus Rift is the super expensive kind of, you know, crazy platform that's going to come out, but cardboard is something as simple as a piece of cardboard and an app. Um, so it was neat to see them kind of harken back to last year, talk about that success. But then, you know, as we guessed, uh, getting a new cardboard that uh, is big enough to support the Nexus 6, which is the latest flagship device. So uh, working with six inch, uh, six inch design phones, um, getting a new button. So uh, it's a little more stable than the magnet button. Um, but also the fact that it's uh, the SDK has been updated now to support iOS. So you could slide a uh, iPhone 6 in there and use cardboard as well, which is again, going back to the openness of, of Google and, and the embracing of everybody, no matter what platform they're on. But it also shows that, you know, Google's got a stake in VR and, and it seems kind of silly that it's a piece of cardboard, but it is it is proving to be as legit as Oculus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, it's you know, I'm, uh, I'm excited to see where it goes from here. Yeah. I mean, bringing it to the masses is, is interesting. We yeah. just had a video there. Jason Howell, as you know, is at Google I.O. and he had a chance to play around with us with it and yeah. he sent us some video. So, yeah, it looks cool. And, you know, and I like that it will fit my iPhone also. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. No keynote or conference, of course, is complete without a nod to the Internet of Things. Uh, for Google, that's Brillo. That's a stripped-down version of Android. It's basically an operating system for things. Uh, what was interesting today to you about that announcement? Well, it was interesting because every I.O. Um, since, oh, geez, maybe three or four years now, uh, when they first mentioned uh, Android Home or, you know, Home at Android or whatever kind of, you know, jumbling of the words of Android and Home, we've been waiting for this idea of a smart home. And then they bought Nest and, you know, this idea of Internet of Things and having a connected refrigerator and connected garage door opener and lights and things like that. And Google's been oddly quiet over about it uh, really ever since they bought Nest. 
Uh, and I guess it's taken longer to integrate with Nest or to get to wherever the vision is. And while they didn't talk about Android at home here, what they talked about was way more interesting to me. Um, you know, the idea that uh, Internet of Things is a buzzword that sometimes, you know, say what you will about it. You might want to roll your eyes at it or whatnot, but it's true. It's coming. I mean, I saw an August lock. Uh, this past weekend, and it works. It's cool. I mean, it's a it's a way to control your front doors with your phone. That's amazing. Um, but the thing is, is that no one has stepped up and built a platform to build Internet of Things on. You've got a bunch of startups and you've got a bunch of companies who are doing their own things and everyone's kind of working in their own proprietary world, but there's no commonality. And so um, it's nice to see Google kind of step up and take the challenge. And I really, when you think about it, of the major technology companies, I think only Microsoft or Google were the only two companies that could do this. Um, and the idea of, you know, by providing Brillo as a, you know, a, like you said, a stripped down or a Brilloized version of Android that people can build off of to build Internet of Things devices and applications is really exciting. But not saying you need to use our software. Um, they also announced Weave, which is a uh, communications protocol that can work with Brillo, but also work with other Internet of Things devices um, so that they can all talk to each other. So it shows Google saying, hey, we want to be involved in this space. We've got Nest. We, we've got these applications we want to build, but we know you're building with stuff too. So you can use our platform or use this communication protocol so we can all talk together. So it's this unifying kind of approach to Internet of Things. Um, and I think next year, next year we'll get the Android at home or, or Brillo at home kind of full experience and you'll see you know what people have done with it what third party developers have done with it and what google's done with it right next year we'll get the things the actual things yeah yeah exactly <laughs> you gotta you gotta lay the groundwork first though right yeah. and of course there'll be all kinds of privacy concerns there that you won't care about that i will yeah. and we'll yeah. talk then next year about listen that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that i'm not that interesting and then not many of us are <laughs> That's my opinion. So let's talk about Google Play for Families. That was an announcement they made today. Um, just sort of a nod to, well, you know, we know that people think the Apple App Store is more friendly uh, to families. It's kind of a walled garden, whereas Google Play has always let anything in. Um, so, I mean, just based on their first shot at family friendliness, the YouTube Kids app, which, I mean, you know, you heard all the kind of porn snuck in there, yeah. ads like crazy. Uh, I'm not that impressed as a parent. <laughs> so uh, what do you think so far about the announcement they made about family yeah, friendly well, Play Store? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll let the disclaimer go that I'm not a parent, so I don't have a stake in the game. Although I do have nieces and and one of them has an Android phone, so I guess I should be a little more concerned than, than not. But um, we knew this was coming. I mean, this is the kind of thing that's been, uh, it was hinted at and then leaked at. Um, I was surprised because... Uh, with YouTube, they rolled out a family app, like a specific different ver version of YouTube that is, you know, supposed to be family friendly, all ages content. I thought they were going to roll a different marketplace completely for families that would be, you know, kind of focused on that. But instead, it's working within the Google Play infrastructure and they've got a kind of a little badge or a little label for uh, family approved apps, um, as well as they've added in, you know, uh, storefronts to view those apps as well as filters. You know, you can search by age range. Or, you know, if your kid's into Dora the Explorer or Spider-Man or whatever characters they might be, might, might be into. So ways to filter those apps. Um, the question is really going to be is, is, you know, how much of this is machine dictated versus actual humans reviewing the apps? That's going to be the, the, the question. Um, and whether or not we see any malware or any inappropriate applications sneak through. I think after the experience of YouTube and the criticisms they've got and with the FTC kind of breathing down their neck about this, I think that this actually will be a strong entry in this field because I think that they realize they can't screw this up because if they screw this up, they lose the trust of, of people who have families and that's a lot of money to, and that they don't want to lose that. So um, I think that they're going to give it their best shot and I'll be curious to see how it goes. And I, I hope it goes well because, you know, you as a parent, you should have confidence in the apps that you're searching and downloading and installing. So Yeah. And ultimately, like I, I'm my children's parent, not Google. So, you know, right. it's like yeah. it's, it's my responsibility, not theirs. Um, and I don't want them to be the parent. I, it's just interesting to me that they haven't figured this out yet because, I mean, they've had safe search for how long? I don't know, for 10 years. So how, I don't know how long it's been there. So it seems like they're well um, into, you know, what which is the Ernie and Bert that the real Ernie and Bert versus the pornographic Ernie and Bert, you know, that's something that yeah. they've probably been dealing with like for a long time. So it just surprised me that, um, that, 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 but I don't know, maybe people were aiming at it just as they were aiming at the map. I mean, the, the things that have happened with maps recently too, you know, with people yeah. hacking in and um, placing things, you know, it's like maybe people are just getting better at um, gaming the crowdsourcing system. Who knows?
Well, and, that, and that's the thing. Google uh, Google is a company that depends on machine learning, um, and we saw it. Uh, Sundar Pichai um, showed the the self driving cars and was showing the example of what the car sees when it's on the road and showing you know the purple you know purple boxes are other cars and yellow boxes are pedestrians and and said that a lot of the technology that's gone into their image search or to their you know other kind of search functions are going into that into that machine learning to allow those self driving cars to be able to drive. So this is a company that wants to build an algorithm to solve a problem. Um, but as we all know, sometimes you need people to be involved. You can't trust the machine all the time. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it's a case of, you know, an app can be submitted with the best of intentions by the developer and 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 say all the right things and all that sort of stuff. Um, and unless you actually have someone test driving the app to prove that it's doing what it says, um, it can slip through. And I think they're aware of that now. And they mentioned um, when they were you know talking about the family friendly uh, Google Play uh, that they they have curation you know curation and teams that are reviewing it. Um, and it will just be the question of how many people they throw at this problem. Right. So finally, one last story. One of the coolest things announced today was Google Jump, which paired with Google Cardboard will offer the $20 version of virtual reality to the masses. Um, they announced a deal they have with GoPro to create a camera for the virtual reality creators. Uh, what did they tell you about this camera today? What did they well, tell yeah, this this is interesting. I mean, it, it kind of it kind of uh, built on the cardboard discussion about saying, okay, now you know now that VR is coming and we've got this you know great opportunity to have these you know 360 immersive experiences, you know we want to help people create a, create these experiences. So they teamed up with GoPro and they've created a spec for a 16 camera device kind of it looks like a carousel almost where all the cameras gonna kind of go into um they've they're just giving the spec for this device so if you wanted to take cameras and build it on your own you could gopro is manufacturing one that you can buy and i believe they had one at google io i think jason got to see it and got to play with it a little bit um but uh, they didn't tell us how much this this device is going to be from GoPro. I can't imagine 16 cameras is cheap. But oh yeah, that, there it is. Um, but so by using this, you can film 360 degrees. And the Jump platform is the software that will take the video that you're recording and stitch it all together, smooth it out, and make it into that kind of um, smooth, immersive VR experience that we saw in the demo. Um, it's really neat. I think that this is super early. I think that this is an example of, hey, look, this is really cool and we can do this, but we're not quite sure how, but we're just going to do it anyway and we're going to give you the tools too and we'll learn together. Um, I thought it was funny that, you know, they kind of went through the steps of how you create that. You, you know, you need the camera and then you need the software to stitch together the stuff from the camera, but then you need a player. And they said, well, we have a player. It's called YouTube. And so <laughs> the fact that they're, you know, t uh, taking YouTube and um, supporting this VR kind of content and with the, you know, by pairing it with cardboard and pulling up the YouTube app, um, you can watch the video, you know, the 360 videos you take if you can afford to buy 16 GoPro cameras. Right. Yeah. Well, Ron, thank you so much. Ron Richards, host of All About Android. You're Ron XO on Twitter. And uh, yeah. where else can people find you? Yeah, you can go to about.me slash Ron XO. And that's got links to my Twitter and my Google Plus and my Instagram and all stuff like that. And um, I'm on Twitter doing All About Android with Jason every week. Love it. Love talking about the Android stuff. And uh, yeah, just follow me on Twitter and you can see where I end up next. So. All right. Thank you so much, Ron. My pleasure. Take care. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. Watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. You can also get the show news and inside stories by following me on Twitter. I am at Megan Maroney. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thank you for watching. We could not do it without you. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.